Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to be back home in Dalton, Georgia. I think this is Dalton, Georgia, right? We've been traveling quite a bit. The last couple of weeks, I've been in Israel and Costa Rica and Nicaragua and traveling all over Nicaragua. And God is doing incredible things through our church in those places. And I just want to give you kind of a high level uh, look at what we've done in these areas. In Israel, we helped open up uh, a Ram- in Ramallah a Christian coffee house, which is so unusual. In, in Ramallah, you don't see anything Christian at all. I mean, maybe a small church, but there's no Christian, strong Christian influence, huge Christian history, but not a lot of Christian influence. And you walk into this coffee shop, and it's just a place of peace. And with Tent Ministries, we were able to open up the coffee house. Hundreds of people showed up. It's going to be a great bright light in the midst of that community. While we were there, we were able to worship with Arab Christians and Jewish Christians, and, and that just doesn't happen. Arabs and Jewish people don't come together unless they're followers of Jesus Christ, where Jesus is the common denominator. And we were able to worship the Lord, and it was such a powerful experience. And then came home for a few hours, and then turned around, brought Austin to Nicaragua, and we opened up a school that our church helped build and fund in the community is the one that came together and built the school so there's ownership on their part. Austin and I were able to go and and share the gospel at this school opening. I mean, saying that um, as parents and teachers, we need to teach our children to love God and love others. If we can do those two things, they can change not only that community, but Nicaragua and the world. And as we're we're speaking and teaching, I thought to myself, you know, in the United States, you, you can do that. You can, you can go to a grand opening and talk about Jesus and, and loving God and loving others, but in a different country, which is under a very dictatorship president, we can share the gospel. And people were saying amen, and it was, it was wonderful. We were able to have a maiden voyage on our uh, ambulance boat that our church purchased. This ambulance boat goes up and down this huge river, the River Bouquet, and in the middle of the, the ri- river, there's our clinic that we help fund and build. And this ambulance goes two hours up and down that river, bringing sick people to this clinic. I mean, it's a huge Christian ministry that Ronnie has helped build. And then not only that, but we were able to have uh, three worship conferences uh, throughout Nicaragua and different locations. And we were able to speak on the importance of, of worship and, and the relationship between a pastor and, and the worship leader. And just God moved in in many ways. And and one night we had several people give their lives to Jesus, new followers of Christ. And it was just wonderful worshiping with with our family, our Christian brothers and sisters in Nicaragua. So we've opened up a lot of things. I was able to be at the Jim Davis Ministry Center that our our church helped uh, fix and rebuild. And this ministry center is a place where our Nicaraguan interns come together and they train other Uh, Nicaraguan young leaders in Christian leadership, and they are making a huge impact in Nicaragua. So thank you so much for your prayers and your giving to Faith Promise. Our dollars are making a kingdom impact. Our prayers are making a kingdom impact. And my heart was uh, uh, uplifted and encouraged, and I hope yours is as well. I I want Austin to share a few of his personal experiences in Nicaragua. So um, one of the words that I felt like the Lord as I was praying on the way down and before the trip... um, that the Lord gave me just for this trip and, and what we were going to be doing in Nicaragua, one of the words that the Lord gave me about this was the word generation. And at each church in each town that we uh, got to come and speak at and worship uh, with them, there was one really consistent thing. I mean, there, there were several consistent things, but one thing I noticed w- uh, that went right along with that word generation that the Lord gave me was that uh, so much leadership, so much uh, pastoral leadership, and, and the worship teams were just filled with young people that were on fire for the Lord, and nothing held their passion back, nothing held, uh, no, nothing took their eyes off of the Lord, and um, even just a, down to as many times a week as they get together, and they just, uh, they pack out the room you know, just with praise and, and just total in, in, in awe of the Lord. Um, it really, it really resonated with me, and, and it encouraged me just to see the church on fire with uh, th- this younger generation that is really uh, coming up as leaders in the church. Um, and, it, and it looks really a lot like 
the beginnings of a revival, really, if, if I'm being honest. Um, I, I know Dean said throughout the week, and, and I kind of experienced, and I've heard other people say that the next Great Awakening will probably come from Central America. And when you go there and you see how people worship and how passionate they are about the Lord and ministry and um, winning people to Jesus, it makes a lot of sense that people say that. Um, you know, one thing, I, I, I never had the pleasure of meeting our, uh, our Ronnie Hopkins, who is our partner down there in Nicaragua until this week, and it was such a great uh, opportunity to spend time with him and get to know him, as well as the other interns that he has uh, ministered to and discipled. But, you know, as we, as Dean and I got off the airplane last night, we were walking to baggage claim, I, I started thinking, and I told Dean this, I said, you know, it's amazing what happens when literally just one person says yes to the call on their life. And really, too, because Ronnie has a wife, so they, they both have to agree uh, to say yes to this call that Jesus has placed on their life. But I just think Ronnie has been there for 17 years, and he's one of the most joy-filled people I've ever met in my life. He'd, I've, I never heard him complain one time <laughs> about anything. He's just he's either joking or he's saying something encouraging and uplifting. And I just think about all the lives that have been touched uh, through through his ministry, just through his simple yes. And so it, it makes me look at my own life and, and think, man, I, I should only I shouldn't be complicating this uh, thing that the Lord is calling me to do, whatever that is. I should just be saying yes because I have no idea how many people around me and for how many generations after me that uh, that the kingdom could spread to if I just simply say yes. And Ronnie is a is an amazing example, living example of that, because you see just uh, how how deep the relationship of of these interns and these guys that he disciples. Uh, how deep their relationships are with Jesus and just how much of a difference they are making in their own community and in their own lives, too. Um, this One more thing before we jump into worship that I, I couldn't help but notice. Uh, I, I'm sure some of you guys know the interns that we've had a few years ago. Uh, one of them's name is Jerry, and he, uh, he translated for me in my teachings and stuff, and he was a huge, huge, huge help and teaching and prayer and, and worship as we communicated and just really enjoyed getting to know him and spend time with him. But I want I want to tell you this something uh, for for as, to the people of Dalton First United Methodist just how much you mean and how much this church impacts uh, the rest of the world. Um, I know a lot of times without going there it's hard to see or it's hard to even imagine or know even when we hear good reports and. Uh, amazing things that are happening that we believe are happening it's hard sometimes when you don't lay eyes on it but uh, we had many hours that we traveled back and forth from town to town to do this and that for mission work uh, opening the school teaching all that good stuff we had many hours to ride in a truck together often <laughs> a really crammed truck for many hours um, but it was all good and, and one thing I noticed is Jerry and I we sat beside each other in the, in the back seat uh, everywhere we go uh, most of the time, I noticed that when Jerry was on his phone, I, I saw a picture that was his background. And now, let, mind you, Jerry has a girlfriend that I believe he really cares about. Jerry has a cool motorcycle. And Jerry ha has a lot of other, and he, he loves coffee. He's a really kindred spirit, I learned, uh, because I, maybe Blake also is, is one of these people, too, that drinks coffee morning, noon, and night. But Jerry is one of those people, and I really felt at home with him. But let me tell you, when I looked at his phone, knowing, learning what I learned about Jerry, do you know what was on his, the background of his phone? A picture of this church. And how many years? It's been four years since Jerry has been here. So I want you to know that this church means a lot to people around the world. What we do here is really important. Um, and continuing to seek the kingdom, seek first the kingdom together is vital for us to continue to allow the Holy Spirit and allow God's mission to continue through what he's doing here and to the ends of the earth. So that's all I, 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 could, I could go on and on and on. Every day felt like a week, and I just, uh, I'm sure it will change the rest of my life forever. But I'm going to just stop it there and invite you to worship. Um, I'm glad to be home with you today. So if you would, let's just stand together. Let's uh, let's go to the Lord this morning and worship.
Father, I love you, and uh, no matter no matter where I am, Lord, I'm thankful to be with my family in Nicaragua as we worship and teach, God, and I'm thankful to be with my family here in Dalton, Lord. So, um, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would come and have your way in this time. Lord, open up our eyes, God, open up our ears to be receptive to you this morning. Lord, we pray that you would show up in power, Lord, and we fix our hearts on you. Lord, I pray that every distraction, everything that is clawing for our attention this morning would just fall to the wayside. Lord, we would fix our eyes on you. We would listen to what you have to say. And nothing would hold back true, honoring praise to your name, God. Come and fill this room, Holy Spirit. Fill our lives, Lord. Lead us this morning as we walk into your presence, Lord. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. Come on, let's lift our voices today. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side forever. Freedom feels like feels like we praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living to sing that melody sometimes simple little melodies that we sing out in unity and lift up a joyful sound of the lord it can really wake us up it can 
could really wake our spirits up. So I just want us to sing this together. Sing, oh, 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 oh. we lift you up today, Lord. Oh, 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 praise you. Oh, 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 we lifted up our song to you, Lord. Oh, darkest 
night, I, I held on to this song and, and remembered the goodness of God. In Nicaragua, I was sharing the gospel with a bunch of youth, and I said, you know, salvation is indeed free, but it will cost you everything as you surrender your life to Jesus, and you surrender your will to his will. This is World Communion Sunday, and the last time I took communion, I was in the garden tomb in Israel. And it's such a powerful thing to be walking around where Jesus walked. And it's so interesting. Every time they unearth a new discovery in the ground, it confirms the Bible again and again and again. At the garden tomb, you could see the skull of the rock. You can actually see a skull in the rock where they think Jesus died. And he didn't die on the hill. He, he died on the bottom of the hill. He would walk by and mock and laugh at those who were being crucified. And as I was there, I couldn't help but think of it was my sin that put him up there. It was my sin. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, you, you walk and you go to the empty tomb and, and you can walk into the tomb and the tomb is empty. He has arisen. He is alive. And it was such an interesting experience because half of the people in the garden were, were weeping. And then the other half of the people were celebrating. Some people were weeping, saying, you know, Jesus, Jesus died for me so that I can live. And the other people are celebrating, Jesus died for me so that we can live. And, and so as Christians, we live on this razor edge of reality. On one hand, we're, we're citizens of heaven. And on the other hand, we're citizens of this world. And so as Christians, we know we're going to be with God forever. We're going to be with Jesus. We are forgiven. We're royalty. We're adopted sons and daughters of the king. And, and we praise God for that. And, but and then the other side of reality is that we live in this broken world. People are hurting. People are lost. People are without hope. And as Christians, we live on this razor edge, and there's moments where we celebrate, hallelujah, Jesus died for me so that I can live for him. But on the other end, it's like, oh, but it's my sin that put him there. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he did three very significant things. On one hand, he, 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 he washed the feet of his disciples. He washed all of them, including Judas's feet. And he was showing us that we're to be servant leaders, that we're to love others. It was a powerful example of his love and servant leadership, that agape love, that sacrificial love, the hallmark of Christianity. And the second thing he said was, love one another. And it's such an obvious thing. As Christians, that's an obvious but he said that because he knew that as disciples, as followers of Jesus, there'd be times we wouldn't love one another. And he was trying to remind them again to love one another. That agape, sacrificial love. And then he leads them in the Lord's Supper. Where he says, do this in remembrance of me. We take the Lord's Supper to remember him, to remember his death, to remember his resurrection, to remember that his life wasn't the end, it was simply the end of the beginning, and it's soon going to be a time when things are fully restored to where it should have been in the first place if we didn't mess it up. When Jesus came, he proclaimed the message, the kingdom of God is at hand. And that message hasn't changed. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26. Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given th thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He poured the wine and said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Drink this in remembrance of me. And then finally this, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you me, you, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he's coming back again. We don't know when, but he's coming back again. Let us pray. Dear Father God, as we partake in this Lord's Supper, we do remember you. We do remember your death, your burial, and your resurrection. We remember that great sacrificial love you have on all of this world. This table is open to all who want to experience God's love and grace this morning. We worship you now during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you who are new to how we take the Lord's Supper lately, we've been doing this mode where you come and you pour a cup and you take a piece of bread and you can pour it for your family and break the peace for your family and, and go back to your seat and you can just pray and contemplate on God's love for you, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And then when you're ready at your time, you can take the bread and then drink the cup. Come and partake in the Lord's Supper. I invite you to stand back up and worship with us.
precious cornerstone. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation. You are faithful to the end. And we are waiting on you, Jesus. We Again together. It's a precious cornerstone, sure foundation. You are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We the glory of your name be the passion of the church let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives we believe you're all to us of the church ought to be glorifying your name, God. Lord, and all over the earth it is. Lord, I just pray today that in the places that I've seen, God, in the places that I've, I've never been before, that I know the church is also burning for you and glorifying you, God. I just pray that we would be drawn to do it more. 
God, that we would have a, a flame that burns brighter and stronger for you. God, that your name would be our passion. That people coming to the name and to the feet of Jesus would be our passion. And Lord, we would not measure our lives by anything else other than what you say about us and what you've done for us. It's really easy to do that, Father. But Lord, all that is to pass away, Lord. But the relationship that we can have with you is forever. So, Lord, keep our eyes fixed on that. Lord, I pray against anything that would come against that being our heart and that being our desire and the saving love of Jesus being the measure of our lives. Lord, we love you. We love to be in your presence and worship you and bring you honor and glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. At this time, the children can go to Children's Church with Miss Sydney. And Lee's going to read her scripture. Now, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to put on your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will put your belt on you and bring you where you do not want to go. Now he said this, indicating by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, Follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lee. Well, it is good to be back home. I got in at 11.30 p.m. last night, and I still don't know what time zone I'm in, but God is good, and he's going to use this service, and he already has been. I, I love the communion this morning, and I'm, I'm so thankful to have communion with my family. Well, eating is one of my favorite pastimes. I, I think I have the spiritual gift of eating. I enjoy eating food, and every time I think of my childhood memories, it always goes back to food settings. At the Osuch family, Easter and Thanksgiving, they were epic days of feasting. My grandmother and grandfather would rent the American Legion Hall, and 30 to, 30 to 60 family members, depending on the timing would show up and we would just eat all day. It was so much fun. And I remember as I traveled all over the world, I've been to 19 different countries, I love eating the food of the culture I'm in because it reminds me of, it, it speaks to their culture actually. So in Israel, we had a lot of Mediterranean food and, and then in uh, Nicaragua, a lot of rice and beans and chicken. Um, when I got home last night, I, I stopped uh, at the battery to pick up my wife. She was with her daughter um, for their little celebration. Uh, Jaden's getting married in a couple weeks. And uh, I got a chicken taco, but I was so tired of rice and beans, I just had fries. So I'll get back to the American side of me. I love eating. And in fact, it's said that this year, the average American will eat 1,996.3 pounds of food this year. So if you've ever gone out to eat and you're like, oh, I ate a ton, well, you would have eaten a ton this year. Food is an important part of our culture and our well-being. There's a story of this husband and wife who ate really bad. They ate to the point of uh, uh, overeating and pain, and which, is, which isn't right, that's wrong. And they ate poorly, and they were in poor health, and they decided that 
they needed to change their diet. And so the wife went to the husband and said, we need to change our diet or else we're going to die. And the husband was not excited about the change of diet, but he wanted to live a longer life. And so they decided to eat fruits and vegetables and healthy foods. And because of that one decision, they lived an extra 20 years of life. One night, they both died peace and peacefully in their, in their beds. And they were ushered into heaven. And they met St. Peter. And St. Peter's like, welcome to heaven. We're so glad you're here. We just want to let you know that everything in heaven is free. I want to show you around. And so St. Peter took this couple to their mansion. And this mansion was beautiful. It was the most beautiful mansion that this couple had ever seen. And the husband's like, wow, you know, this is incredible. How, how much is rent here, mortgage? St. Peter's like, you don't understand. You're in heaven. A everything is free. The husband's like, that's awesome. And St. Peter's like, you haven't seen anything yet. I want to show you the golf course. And so they took the couple to the golf course, and sure enough, it was the most beautiful golf course they had ever seen. I mean, both of them were just blown away by the beauty of this golf course. Course, And, and, and the husband was like, wow, I mean, th cer certainly this isn't free. St. Peter, what are the green fees here? I mean, how, how, what, what's the, the club membership cost here? And St. Peter's like, you don't understand. You're in heaven. Every, everything is free. The husband's like, this is awesome. St. Peter's like, you haven't seen anything yet. I want to take you to the banquet hall. And so they took this couple to the banquet hall, and sure enough, there is food from all these different countries, all these different places, and every food you can imagine. And St. Peter's like, listen, you can eat whatever you want here. You won't get calories. You won't get fat. I mean, it's just as much as you want. It's for, for your enjoyment. And the husband's like, man, certainly this is going to cost me. He's like, St. Peter, how much does this cost? I mean, this is incredible. St. Peter's like, no, nope, you still don't get it. You're in heaven. Everything is free, including no calories here. And the husband at that point turned to his wife and said, if it was <laughs> food, it's important. In fact, I'd, I'm not a big fish eater. I never liked salmon, but I discovered divorce-proof salmon. And now it's my favorite meal. And I'm not going to get into all the details on how to prepare this, but secret ingredient, ingredient brown sugar game changer. Food is important. Well, this morning we, we read this passage, and I just want to give some observations and then some truths from the passage that we just read this morning. Well, let me give you some background information here. It's John 21, 15 through 19. Jesus had resurrected. He made himself known to the disciples, and the disciples went back to fishing at the Sea of Galilee. Jesus then appears to them and has breakfast with them. Food is important brings people together, and he has this exchange with them, this love, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? This is important because if you remember, Peter had denied Jesus three times, just not too long ago. In fact, all the disciples, they ran away from our Savior. And if you remember Judas, he, obviously he be betrayed Christ. And it's interesting, when you look at Judas, he betrayed Jesus, and he ended up committing suicide. And then you had Peter, who denied Christ, and yet was restored back into ministry. And when you look at why that happened, it's interesting to see that Judas knew he was wrong. That's why he committed suicide. But he tried to remedy the situation by taking it care, of, care of it himself. He looked inward to take care of the problem. Where Peter, he was looking outward. And Jesus appeared to him and, and said, do you love me? Yes, do you love me? Yes. And finally, he's restored into ministry. It's an interesting picture of those two individuals. One commits suicide, one is restored. One doesn't look outward, one, one, one looks outward. Another thing here is that the disciples go back to their fishing at the Sea of Galilee, and it's interesting that when you look at what happened at the Sea of Galilee, so many things happened. The disciples were called into ministry at the Sea of Galilee when Jesus said, follow me. And they go back to the very place where they met Jesus in the first place. And at the end of the conversation, Jesus says, follow me. Now, there's a lot of debate on why the disciples went back to fishing. I, I think one of it is because that's all I knew before meeting Jesus. But 
while they were out there at the Sea of Galilee and they were looking at the places where Jesus ministered, I bet they were reminded of Jesus. Oh, that's where Jesus walked on water. Oh, that's where he he healed the sick. That's when he gave sight to the blind. And I think that gave them some level of peace in the midst of all this misunderstanding that they're having, even after the resurrection. Have you ever gone through that dark night of the soul? (laughs) All of us have. And I tell you, there's some things that have kept me grounded. And a couple of that, a couple of those things was that song, The Goodness of God. That song saved me during my period of darkness. And it reminded me of my Savior. It reminded me of his love for us and how it never ends. If you're going through a difficult time, if the joy of your salvation is gone. Go back to the day you said yes to Jesus. And remember the time when you crossed from darkness into light. If that doesn't restore your soul to some degree, I don't don't know what else to say. Because that's what the disciples did. They went back to where they met Jesus, where they experienced Christ, where, where they followed him. And so when Jesus restores Peter back into ministry... He says, follow me. Pick up where where I left off. And then final observation about this conversation, do you love me, do you love me? When Jesus says, do you love me, to Peter, it's that Greek word agape, that sacrificial love. Peter, do you love me? Do you sacrificially love me? And his response was a brotherly love. It wasn't the agape love. It was a brother. Yeah, Jesus, yeah, I love you. No, no, Peter, Peter, do do you love me? Agape love. Do you sacrificially love me, Peter? Oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus, we're we're good. We're buddies, we're good. And then finally the third, third, Peter, no. Do, Do you love me, Peter? And then he realizes what's being spoken to of him. And he finally gets it, what Jesus was asking of him to sacrificially love him back. Interesting observations there. But this morning, I want to leave you with just three truths from this passage. Truth number one, the flocks are paramount. The flocks are paramount. Others. The flocks are paramount. Do you love me? Then tend my sheep. Do you love me? Then shepherd my sheep. Do you love me? Then tend my sheep. Again and again, it puts others. Then do others. Serve others. Love others. Minister to others. Reach out to others. Help others. Again, if you're, if you're in that, that dark place and you're, in your, and you're struggling, what happens is we get so inward focused. We focus so much on our problems. And, and it's like, oh, you have to break free from that. And one way to break free from that is to love others. In August, back in August, one of the, man, huge highlights of the year thus far is when I saw 140 church members come together to pack 16,000 meals. And if you were a part of that night, you felt the vibe. You felt the, the awesome spirit that was there as we uh, made these meals for people in need. And, and, and you all know, our church, we're going through a difficult time right now. We ha- we're trying to find ourselves. And, and there was been months this year where I've, I've had some difficult nights. I've been struggling with what's going on and, and, and what God did for me is that he gave me two weeks to serve others in Israel and Nicaragua. And it's interesting when you're serving others in Nicaragua and Israel, man, it's things that are, seem really big here get really, really small. When you serve others and love others, problems get smaller and smaller because you see the bigger picture of what's happening. See, we need to understand that our job as Christians is to do two things. We are to love God and sacrificially love others. If we do those two things, that's the game changer. And, and even though we're going through this difficult season of the church, as a church, I am I'm putting my life on the line to make sure we continue to love God and love others through this. Because when we do, man, the kingdom impacts.
impact happens all around us. The sheep are paramount. Sacrificially love others. Number two, food is essential. Food is essential. Jesus says, tend my sheep, shepherd my sheep, tend my sheep. All three of those Greek words have this notion of, of feeding. And feeding is so important. And as shepherds, you're to lead the sheep into green pastures. Now, a lot of people use this as pastors. So I'm a pastor of the church. My job as a pastor is to lead you to green pastures. But you shepherd people as well. You have family that you shepherd. If you're in a small group, those people you can shepherd. In, or a Sunday school class, you shepherd. Or people at work and, and uh, fellow believers, you can shepherd. So even though this passage is used quite often, and rightly so, for pastors of a church, God has given people in our circles of influence to shepherd along the way. And as we all know, shepherd, shepherds and sheep, it's an interesting relationship because sheep are pretty, pretty dumb. We know that. Sheep are dumb. And there's this video that's so interesting on, on uh, uh, Facebook that you see this little sheep, it, it's stuck in this hole. And for two minutes, this lady's trying to pull that sheep out of the hole. And after two minutes, the sheep comes out and it hops and hops and hops and jumps back in the same hole. Sheep aren't that smart. Sheep will go and eat poisonous food and die and kill themselves unawares. As Christians, as shepherds, we're to shepherd and lead our sheep to good food and not eat poisonous food. I, I, and you've heard love wins, and I, I believe at the end of time, love does win. God does win. He's love. But love warns along the way. As Christians, we're to warn people not to eat the deadly, deadly stuff, the deadly roots, but to eat from the green pastures. If we see a Christian living in sin, we're to lovingly go to that person and, and, and help them to the green pastures. And I'd say that to me. If you see me living in sin, I pray and give you permission to speak into my life to say, hey, Dean, what you're doing is wrong. You've got you to gotta repent and turn. As shepherds, that's what you do. You lead the sheep to the green pastures. The flocks are paramount. The food is essential. But feeders are vulnerable. Number three, feeders are vulnerable. As shepherds, as leaders, as, as people of influence, in your areas of influence, we're vulnerable. There's a, there's a danger for us to lean towards legalism. Legalism exists when people attempt to secure righteousness in God's sight by good works. Legalists believe that they can earn or merit God's approval by performing the requirements of the law. Legalism focuses on God's law more than a relationship with God. It keeps external laws without a truly submitted heart. And legalism adds human rules to divine laws and treats them as divine. Legalism adds human rules to divine laws and treat them as divine. There's a danger for all of us to lean towards legalism. There's a danger for us to be hypocrites. Hypocrites, the practice of proclaiming to have moral standards or belief to which one's own behavior does not conform. That's one of my dangers of, of being a pastor. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a sinner. I, I make mistakes. But boy, I want to repent and turn as quickly as possible. Feeners are vulnerable to un, unhealthy living. We're living in a day and age where it seems like every time you turn on the news, you see another pastor leaving ministry of un unhealthy patterns and relationships he's gotten himself or herself into. We need to be praying for our pastors. We need to be praying for people that um, are over authority to us. I have a, I have, pastor Brian is my authority. I pray for, him, pray for him all the time. And I hope that during this, this season of the church in particular that you're praying for your pastors. This is, not, this is not what I signed up for ministry for. I signed up to minister to, to encourage people to further the kingdom of God. So pray for your pastors during this time. Pray for your hearts. Because the enemy wants to turn our hearts against each other, and, and we can't do that. 
even if you disagree with your brother and sister in Christ, we're to pray for one another and lift them up. So the question I want to, some questions I want to ask you this morning, how are you, how are you taking care of God's flock over the people that God has allowed you to oversee, either wh- whether it be here or overseas? One of the things we've been doing in the last couple of months is a mentorship program called the MED program. And I have many people here from Nicaragua, young Christian leaders, men and women, men and women, who are part of this program. And they have partnered one of the Nicaraguan students with our, some of our members of the church. And these are the ones that have been picked. These are the ones that are left over. And one way you can shepherd people overseas is by mentoring them. This is a pen pal program. Once a month, you send a letter to our interns or the Christian, Christian young leaders in Nicaragua, and you can mentor and shepherd them in their faith. Some of them are pastors. That's okay. You can still give words of wisdom. You can still encourage them. You can still say you're praying for them. It's part of the shepherding process. So who are you shepherding? I'm so blessed to have two men in my life that I shepherd on a weekly basis. They speak truth into my life. They hold me accountable. I shepherd them. They shepherd me. It's a wonderful relationship. Who are you praying for? Are you praying for your leaders, your Christian leaders, your spiritual leaders? Have you denied Jesus like Peter? Maybe not verbally, but have you lived your life independently away from him? If you have, repent and turn back to him. Jesus says to you and to me, do you love me? And tend his sheep. Jesus says, do you love me? Shepherd his sheep. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much that you've allowed us to come here this morning to open up your word, to sing praises to you. We're so blessed to be living in this country where we can do that freely. I think of our friends in Ramallah where they fear coming together because of the country that they live in. During this World Communion Sunday, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ and Ramallah and Israel and Nicaragua in particular. Lord, as they celebrate you this morning, I pray that you would just make yourself known to them in a real and powerful way. God, I thank you that we can come and and have communion together this morning to remember you. And Lord, I pray that during this, this season of our church that you would protect our hearts, that we would continue to love you, that we would continue to sacrificially love each other and our community and this world. We don't know when you're coming back, but you're coming back soon, and we don't want to be caught not making an impact for you. We want to be caught making disciples, sharing your love to others, and making a difference in this world. God, we love you so much. Help us stay close to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to worship and uh, encourage you to use this time as a time of prayer and uh, let you know that the offering is open to worship with tithes and offerings at this moment too. So let's uh, let's join together and sing and worship today as uh, we just allow the Lord to search our heart today. the key
that this is October. October 2nd is finally here. This month we are going to have our fall festival the last Wednesday of this month. We are collecting candy, so if you can bring candy for that event, that would be wonderful. We expect about 800 to 1,500 people that come through that night. It's a great outreach to our community, so please bring some candy, and if you'd like to use your car as a trunk or treat, let me know or let Susie know, and we'll have a, a great trunk and treat for the kids as well as games and, and so forth. Thank you so much for your love and your prayers and, and for uh, your giving to this church. We are making a kingdom impact. Let's keep doing that in the name of Jesus. God bless you all. Have a great afternoon.